verses 1 through 5. Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 5, and there we will find these words written. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. From those passages of Scripture and others, I want to preach this morning from this subject, believing prayer. I'm talking about believing prayer. Prayer has always been and always will be the strength of the Christian. The Bible in many places on, and on many occasions encourages and admonishes believers to pray. It tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 to pray without ceasing. In Luke 18 and 1, we are told to always pray and not faint. It reminds us in James chapter 5, verse 17, that the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. And it encourages us in Philippians 4 and 6 to be careful or anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication to make our requests known unto God. The word pray or some form of it occurs some 500 plus times throughout the entire Bible. And this is a strong indicator of how important this grace called prayer is to the Christian believer. And we are privileged of God to be able to involve ourselves in such a grace as prayer. But even more striking than this is the fact that during the life of Jesus, on numerous occasions, we are told that while it was a great while before day, Jesus, the Son of God, got up himself and will resort to a quiet place, and he spent considerable time in prayer. That being said, we need no other example or reason to submit and affirm to you the fact that if Jesus prayed, what about us? Now, I'm not going to spend time this morning talking about the parts of prayer or some of the things that are usually mentioned about prayer. I would hope that those aspects of prayer that you're familiar with and you don't need a review in. Instead, I want to be sure that as we look at this text this morning, that we pay close attention to the scene that's happening and see how important it is for us to engage in what I would call believing prayer and what it takes to do so. So, what is believing prayer, Pastor? Well, it's really nothing special or nothing that is, or something that is for certain people in the church. Believing prayer is exactly what it says it is. It's believing in prayer and believing in what you pray. Now, on the surface, that sounds simple. But if the truth be told, many people who pray really don't believe what they pray, nor do they believe that their prayers are effective. Okay? Most people now, they want to believe their prayers are being heard and answered. But the reality is many people just ain't sure. Yet they go from day to day going through the motions, but, but in reality, it's just an exercise in futility because they've not engaged in believing prayer that makes all the difference. So how then do we change the trajectory of our prayer life in order that we can be certain that we indeed are operating in what I call believing prayer? And of course, uh, if you read chapter 12, 
as you encourage a dude, you, you would already know that even the early church, there were times that when the church prayed but didn't believe the answer when God gave the answer. So we just, you know, we do it and they did it. And therefore, to get a better sense of how we can enhance our belief in prayer and be more confident in our praying, here's my first point. What we need to do is understand the reality of the situation being prayed about. In other words, when we're praying, we need to know the severity of the situation. All right? Chapter 12 opens up with some disturbing news for the believers. James has been beheaded. Okay? Now, this James is the brother of John and who was one of the 12, and not James, who's the Lord's brother, who's going to be one of the leaders in the Jerusalem church. If you recall, James and John's mother had approached Jesus and requested that her two sons be granted the privilege of sitting one on the left and one on the right of Jesus when he came to the kingdom. And of course, Jesus politely tells them that privilege is only given by my father. Only he can give that privilege. But Jesus did ask them if they would be able to drink the cup that he would drink from, to which they replied, oh yeah, we can do that. Well, the cup that he was referring to was the cup of suffering and death. And indeed, they both would drink from it as well as all those who follow Jesus will do in some shape, form, or fashion. See, it goes without saying, my brothers and sisters, that those who follow Jesus will face some bitter cups in life. There's no getting around it. But the encouraging news is that we don't drink the cup alone. And although it may have a bitter taste going down, the aftertaste that it leaves is the sweetness of eternal life. James has been beheaded. But not only has James been beheaded, Peter has been arrested, is in prison, and he's on deck to be next. Now, as we've seen previously, the church has endured persecution since her inception from Jewish religious leadership. But also, the governmental powers that be They've not made things easier for the church as well. And Herod, who is the ruler at this time, is not going to make it easier because he has a problem. And the problem that Herod has is that folks don't really like him. Right? They don't like Herod. He's paranoid. He does not even trust his own family. And so anything that Herod can do to win the favor of the people, he's going to do it. It doesn't matter how atrocious it is. If it's going to help his popularity and his ratings, Herod's going to do it. That's why the text says when he saw that what he did to James pleased the people, he decided, well, let me go get another head for the people getting my head. Here is something that we need to be, that we see a whole lot of the day. Individuals who will lower their standards and compromise their integrity just to remain in power by being people pleasers rather than standing for truth and righteousness no matter who it upsets. See, too many people would rather have the, 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 the approval of men rather than the applause of God. Okay? And when this is done, this is the case that, 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 that happens. The Christian believer needs to be aware and on guard because you're going to become public enemy number one because you don't go alone to get along. Right. See, when you take a stand for truth and don't go along with the wrongdoing with folk and not trying to please people, please God, folk will come at you. And so this is a very serious situation that Peter is in. But when you understand the severity of the situation, you'll know what you're up against. It ought to help direct the focus of your praying. All right? See, prayer is not aimlessly calling words with wishful thinking. But it should be done with confidence, clarity, and a common sense of reality. The situation at hand was real. James had been beheaded. That's serious, y'all. Peter is in prison waiting to be beheaded. That's serious. So how do you pray under those situations? What do you say? How, 
James has, has been killed, and, and I know people are saying, how do you pray in your grief? How do you maintain an attitude of prayer under those circumstances? Well, I don't know if I have all the answers this morning to that. But one thing I do know is this. You can't wait until you get in the fire to put your fireproof suit on. In other words, you don't wait until you really need to pray before you learn how to pray. <laughs> see, see, you, you need to already have a life of prayer intact with the Lord. So regardless of the situation, you can appeal to him for strength to endure and to be able to assess the severity of the situation in a way that helps you trust God regardless of the situation. But watch this. What I love about God is that he understands our weaknesses and our frailties. And God knows that oftentimes we have difficulty focusing when it comes to praying. I don't know about you, but sometimes I have trouble praying and staying focused. I don't know about y'all. We have those issues. But because we have those issues, God helps us. In Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray as we ought. But the Spirit itself make an accession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Praise be to God. <laughs> See, because of God's omniscience, God knows what our prayer is, even under the most stressful times, and when I can't get the words out or get my thoughts together, the Holy Spirit intercedes on my behalf. That's why it's imperative for us to live and be led of the Holy Spirit. That's his role in our lives. And we need to understand the reality of the situation. And when we do, we'll pray in accordance with the will of God and we'll not have any unrealistic expectations of what we believe God is going to do. See, sometimes people be praying about stuff and God didn't promise to do what they're praying about. And so... If we're going to be, we have believe in prayer. We need to understand the reality of the situation. But then secondly, if we're going to engage in believe in prayer, it's important for us, and here's my second point, to understand the resume of the one being prayed for. First of all, we got to understand the reality of the situation we're praying about. But then secondly, we need to understand the resume of the one being prayed for. Or let me put it this way. What is the relationship between the Lord and the one we're praying for? All right? The text says Peter's in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Now, I think it's important when we pray for people that we have some sense or idea about their relationship with the Lord when we pray for them. Okay? Let me explain. If someone who does not know the Lord ask you to pray for them because they have an incurable disease. Which is the most important prayer for them? That they get healed or that they get saved? Okay. I hope you answer saved <laughs> because that's most important. See, if they are saved and don't get healed from a physical illness, then God's grace is sufficient for them. But not being saved is a big deal whether they're healed or not. Because if they ain't saved and they die, they in trouble. Here's the point. The resume or relationship that one has with the Lord helps determine how we pray for them. So what is Peter's resume? Well, Peter, we know, knows the Lord. Right? His faith is strong. His witness about the Lord is certain. Peter's been here before, so there are some things that we don't need to worry about Peter about. Now, that does not mean that he does not need prayer, okay? But the reality is, if he gets killed like James, Peter's going to be fine, all right? But Peter ain't worried about being killed, okay? And I'm going to tell you why he ain't worried in a few minutes. But before I do, I need to refer to a, back to a passage of Scripture and an early scenario in Acts to help strengthen my point about us understanding the resume of our people when we pray for them. If you recall in Acts chapter 8, 
when the Samaritans received the Holy Spirit under the preaching of Peter, under the preaching of Philip, Peter came down from Jerusalem to Samaria to confirm the saints. And there was an individual named Simon who was a sorcerer who, when he saw the Holy Ghost being bestowed upon Samaritans as Peter laid hands on them, he offered Peter money and, and requested that he be given the power of the Holy Ghost so he could give the Holy Spirit to those who he wanted to, okay? Peter tells Simon he needs to repent because he's in the gall of bitterness thinking that the Holy Spirit can be bought with money. Watch this. Simon asked Peter to pray for him that those bad things that he said wouldn't happen to him. He said, I need you to pray for me. Peter's response is, you don't need prayer, you need to repent. Okay? See, when we know a person's resume or track record with the Lord, it makes a difference how we pray for them. Simon didn't have no relationship with the Lord. He need no prayer. He need to get saved. And sometimes we pray in the wrong stuff for people, and when it don't happen, we think God ain't moving. See, here's Peter's resume. <clears throat> This isn't the first time he's been in prison. His resume shows that he's experienced in prison ministry, all right? Therefore, for him, it's no issue because he's doing what he's been called to do with understanding of what goes along with it. He may get killed, he may not. Here's what we need to consider, my brothers and sisters. Should prayer be for Peter's release or should it be for his sustainment and witness while he's in prison? And I think if we view it from Peter's standpoint, we might understand it differently. From verses 6 to verse 12, uh, in chapter 12, we see the events and Peter's action in those events that give us an idea of Peter's mindset. First of all, we know he's in prison and is waiting to be killed the next day by Herod. But what is Peter doing? The text says he's sleeping between two guards that he's chained to. Now, how in the world can you sleep when you know you're scheduled to be beheaded the next day? Well, you sleep because you have a resume of trusting God who gives you peace in the midst of trouble. That's how you sleep. You sleep because you know the words of Scripture that says in Psalms 4 and 8, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep for thou, Lord, only makes me dwell in safety. You sleep because you know that there are people praying to God on your behalf, and whatever God allows is good with you. When you have a resume of faithfulness and trust in the Lord, you don't worry about him getting you out of situations as much as being confident that he is with you in the situation. That's why Job could say, though he slay me, Yet I'll trust him. That's why Daniel could sleep in the lion's den. That's why the Hebrew boys said to Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to have a business meeting about our decision because our God will deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we know he's able. Therefore, we ain't going to bow to you. David would say it like this, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It's just a shadow. Shadows don't hurt nobody. That's why I ain't going to fear no evil. And even that's why Paul and Silas could sing songs of praise and offer prayers to God in a Philippian jail because of God's faithfulness. And watch this. Here's something else we got to consider as it relates to what we're praying for. You, you remember, see, when Paul and Silas was in jail, we might think that the prayer might be to get them out. Okay? But listen at Paul's prayer request to the Colossian church in Colossians 4.3. He says, with all praying also for us that God will open up a door to us of utterance to speak the mission of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, that I may make manifest as I ought to speak. Even while Paul is in prison, his prayer request to the church is not to get out, but that he has opportunity to witness for Christ while he's inside the prison. Now, I told you earlier that I would tell you why Peter was not worried about being killed, which allowed him to be asleep like he did. I told you I was going to let you know why he would do that, didn't I? Well, I wasn't lying. I'm going to do it right now. Here's why Peter could sleep in peace 
when Herod's plan is to kill him the next day. In John chapter 21 and verse 18, when Jesus, after his resurrection, is, and meets the disciples on the seashore, and, and he has that conversation, conversation with Peter about, Simon, do you love me? Feed my sheep. He does it three times. Restore him. Well, in verse 18, here's what Jesus says to Peter. He says, verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou was young, thou girdest thyself and walkest where thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he signifying by what death he should glorify God. You see that? Jesus tells Peter, way before this happens, what kind of death he's going to suffer. And the time frame is going to happen. So Peter can sleep because it ain't the right kind, nor is it the right time. <laughs> Listen, Peter knew he wasn't getting ready to get beheaded, and he knew he had not reached the old age that Jesus told him to. It wasn't the right kind of death because he wasn't going to get beheaded. He was going to die as crucifixion like Jesus promised. And it wasn't the right time for him to die now because he wasn't that old yet. And so Peter had a resume that rested on the promise of God of what Jesus had told him. That's why he could sleep. Listen, and when you know the resume of those you're praying for, your prayer focus is different than what you might pray for someone who does not know the Lord. Oh, my God. Mm. So in believing prayer, you need to understand the reality of the situation being prayed about. And then you need to understand the resume of the one you're praying for. But finally, here's my last point. In believing prayer, you need to understand the role of the one being prayed to. Right? You need to understand the role of the one being prayed to. Do we trust God or do we trust the God we are praying to? Or are we dependent on our ability to convince him that our requests are worthy of his attention? Okay. That's what we have to say. Do, do we really trust God to do what he says he's going to do? Or do we need to trust, want him to trust, our, we got to convince him that God, you need to hear what I'm praying about now. You need to answer this. Again, the text says, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Now, here's the question. What is the church praying for him about? Okay? Because when you read the chapter and see that when Peter shows up to the house, they don't believe it's him. Verses 13 through 16, let me read it, says, Peter knocked at the door of the gate. Damsel comes to the door, named Rhoda. And it said, when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, girl, you mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. And then they said, oh, that's just his angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, watch this, they were astonished. <laughs> okay, so help me out here. Verse 5 plainly says, the church is without ceasing praying to God for Peter. Verse 16 says, when they opened the door, they saw him, they were astonished. My question is, what were they praying to God for? Were they praying for God to get him out? Because he did. Were they praying for God to work a miracle? Because he did. Were they praying for God to override Herod's plan? Because he did. Everything about Peter's deliverance, God did it, but they didn't believe it. God gave Peter peace that allowed him to sleep while chained between the guards. God sent an angel to do for Peter what he could not do for himself. Okay? God made the chains fall off him. God brought him out past the guards. God opened an iron gate. God upset the expectations of Herod and the Jews because when they came looking for Peter the next day, Pete was gone. But the church that was praying for him didn't believe it. 
My brothers and sisters, we are given the privilege of prayer. But the success of the prayer lies in the sovereign hand of an almighty God. He knows how to answer, and he knows when and what to answer. He knows that sometimes we don't believe what we pray, but he still wants us to trust him. He knows that sometimes we don't pray right, but he still wants us to trust him. That's why Paul says in Ephesians 3.20, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. The power that works in us is the power of faith that surpasses all understanding. In Mark chapter 11, as I go to a close a few days before Jesus crucified, he had cursed a fig tree on his way to Bethany because the fig tree should have had some figs on it, but it didn't. And the next day when they saw the tree, Peter says, Lord, the fig tree that you cursed is withered away. And Jesus says to him, have faith in God. And that's what I want to leave you with this morning, my brothers and sisters, is just to have faith in God. I know that it seems like it's bleak in your life, but have faith in God. I know it seems like your life has a curse upon it, and you're withered away, but have faith in God. I know situations and circumstances seem unbearable right now, but have faith in God. I know it doesn't seem like you're going to make it from day to day, but have faith in God. I know times are tough on every hand, but have faith in God. I know you think that you're at the end of your rope and your get up and go done got up and went, but I want you to have faith in God. That's what Jesus said, have faith in God, because if you have faith in God, he says, whosoever shall say to this mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but believe those things which he shall have, they're going to come to pass. Whatsoever ye shall desire when ye pray, believe that you receive them and ye shall have them. Listen, I don't know what you need the Lord to do for you this morning. I don't know what you need the Lord to make happen in your life right now. I'm not sure what the reality of your situation is right now. I can't speak about your personal resume with the Lord right now. But I do know what role God wants to play in your life so that he can answer your prayers according to his will. And the reason I know is because of what he did for us over 2,000 years ago. Listen, if you remember in the Gospel of John, chapter 17, the Apostle John records for us what is actually the Lord's prayer. It's not the model prayer that he taught his disciples to pray, but it's the actual prayer that Jesus prayed for his disciples. And it's the prayer that he prayed for those who believe on him through their word, including us. In the Garden of Gethsemane, the place where Jesus would often go to and pray, John records these words for us that Jesus prays on our behalf. He says, beginning in verse 20, neither pray I for these alone, but for them which also shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Listen, I'm glad to know this morning that Jesus prayed for me. My mama prayed for me. My daddy prayed for me. My brothers and sisters prayed for me, but thank God Jesus prayed for me. But not only did he pray for me, he did something else. He died on Calvary for my sins. They hung him high and they stretched him wide. And he died for the sins of the world. He died to one soldier, says, surely this must be the son of God. He died for your sins and mine. But the story didn't stop there. They took him off that cross and they put him in a borrowed tomb where he stayed there for three days and nights. But early, I said early, early Sunday morning, he had the grave with all power and authority in his hand. And I'm glad 
I'm glad this morning that I can believe when I pray that God will answer. Doesn't matter what the situation is. Doesn't matter what's going on. Doesn't matter who says it ain't going to happen. God is able to do anything but fail. And if we trust him without doubt, he'll do it according to his will. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for the fact that, God, you are able to not only hear but answer prayer. Thank you for believing prayer and helping us to understand what it really means for us as a church. Help us, oh God, when we pray to really understand the reality of the situation that we're praying about. Help us to understand the resume of those we're praying for. And help us understand the role of the God that we're praying to. We'll bless you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. As we go away, let us remember what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard, our hearts have felt. Don't forget to do what this week? Don't forget to forgive somebody. And as the opportunity presents itself, what are we going to do? Share the love of Jesus Christ with those you come in contact with. Our departure course, and we're ready to go. As you go, forgive somebody. Someone needs forgiveness now. As the opportunity presents itself, share the love of Jesus Christ. Share the love of Jesus Christ.